Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had just begun to look at chapter 14. In our present context, we are looking at that which is in part and that which is perfect or mature. Or in verse 11 of chapter 13, that which is childish and that which is mature. This may be somewhat of a controversial video, I assure you. I suggested, and I, I assume that's contrary to the mainstream opinion, I suggested that all of the gifts mentioned in our present context have ceased. They have ceased. Verse, verse 8. Love, though, however, never fails, of, of chapter 13. Love never fails, but prophecies, they shall fail. Tongues, they'll cease by themselves, says the grammar. And knowledge, it'll vanish away. And so these gifts that were given here were given until that which is perfect came, or should come. And it came. And you'll remember in that study, I went through a dozen or so opinions of, of what perfect means, what the perfect is. And I suggested to you that my opinion, and no one has to agree with that, but my opinion is it was the completion of the canon, the completion of this book, the reason I suggest that all of these gifts have ceased is because of the completion of the Word of God. You have to imagine yourself in a historical context here. When we get to Ephesians, we find that when he ascended up on high, he did give gifts to men and to the church, and they were apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers, and those are different gifts. I believe. And we began the 14th chapter. Then follow after, pursue after love, which was the conclusion of the 13th chapter. And desire, be jealous for, and that's a present imperative, a command, that which is spiritual, the love which is spiritual. Especially in order that you may prophesy. Now, this is the same word that's called prophecy or prophesy in verse 8 of chapter 13, but I've pointed out many times, many times I have pointed out the fact that words have to be taken in context, like just like the word bark. You know, is, is it the noise from a dog or is it the covering on a tree? And it depends on the context. And little emphasis is given on the context today. Yes, it is the same word. That word uh, means, depending on the context, telling the future or proclaiming. Uh, two possible meanings of the word. Well, actually there's more than two, but those are the two primary meanings of that word. Uh, telling the future, or proclaiming. I believe that the text of verse 8 in chapter 13 is uh, forth telling or future telling, telling the future, uh, that which is, uh, had not yet been revealed in the, uh, in the completion of the Word of God. And from my standpoint, you don't have to agree with that, but that's what I think it means here. Uh, we are to follow after the love. It's a very specific love, which I suggested was the love of God, which was the subject of chapter 13, and seriously desire that love which is spiritual, not these other kinds of love, especially in order that we may proclaim, that's not tell the future, but proclaim. I don't uh, believe it's a gift up in 13. It, it doesn't say, but rather that you have the gift of prophecy. In fact, many commentaries 
on this passage of Scripture indicate that you ought to look for the better gifts. But clearly, the subject made, made clear in chapter 13, in chapter 12, is that it's God who gave the gifts, not you. I think God has determined what gifts you have. I do not think, I don't think that you are exhorted to say, I, I don't like that gift. Uh, I want another one. So I, I don't think that you should especially seek the gift of telling the future or prophecy, but you should especially be concerned about proclamation. And I would say that that primarily refers to the gospel, the good news concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. But at the very least, it's the proclaiming the truth of His Word, all truth of the truth of His Word. And we went on. Uh, then we've already done this. In, in the second verse, the one that speaks in an unknown tongue, and the word unknown, folks, isn't there in the Greek. In a language that he didn't know, speaks not to men but to God. And no man understands him. In the Spirit, he speaks mysteries, verse 3. But he that speaks, proclaims, speaks unto men, to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Isn't the difference between verse 2 and verse 3 childishness and maturity? The one that speaks in a language he didn't know speaks not to men, but to God, because men don't understand it. No man understands him. In spirit. And I suggested that that could be the Holy Spirit, but I don't think it's the Holy Spirit because it isn't articulative and it's, and it's a dative in the grammar. Grammar is important. We have to look at the grammar in his spirit. He's uttering secrets that nobody knows, so he hasn't edified anybody. And that's childish. Now, follow me here because the, the contrary is that if you proclaim, not, not tell the future, the context is, is not telling the future. That's what the word means, to proclaim in this context. He that proclaims God's word in this context is speaking to men with, with three expected results. One is edification to build us up. The one who proclaims God's Word is speaking to men to build them up, to encourage them, and to comfort them. Dearly beloved, I think if you go to any service where God's Word is being taught, and those three results, if those three results don't follow what is said, then you haven't heard truth. I know you can take the text, you know, the, the Spirit is convicting, but, but folks, the Holy Spirit does not convict you, God's child. The purpose of, or intention of the Holy Spirit in your life is not conviction, but to build you up, to encourage you, to comfort you. One who is really proclaiming God's Word is building you up, is, is encouraging you, and comforting you. Maybe you're involved in a ministry where there's very little edification, very little exhortation, very little comfort. Many people walk away from church today more starved than ever. You'll never perish. You'll never perish. What do we do when we stand before God and say, well, gee, I didn't know that I could never perish. I wish someone had told me about that years ago. 
Well, he says it in numerous places. No man can come unto me except my Father, which is in heaven, draws him, drags him, forces him, and in Christ we are secure. All the Father has given me, I, I shall not lose not one. There's nothing secretive about that. It's exactly what the Word says. But the great majority of professing Christianity today doesn't believe it. Even though it's a clear statement of Scripture. They, they don't believe it. The Word of God, folks, ought to build you up. We are His children. You know, and it's the easiest thing in the world to spend your life rehashing all of the sin that's occurred in your life, all of your failures, and there's plenty of it in every one of our lives, every one of us. And we can spend time doing that rather than rejoicing in what Christ has done for us. Being built up in the fact that God Almighty loves us with an everlasting love, left heaven's glory, died in our place, redeemed us so that we stand before Him. We are, we are spotless, but we know we're sinners. We know what we've done wrong. We don't deny the fact that we, that we sin. But it won't have be our master because we're not under law but grace. We know the horrible things in our life. But to dwell on those is like saying, we don't believe what God said. Dearly beloved, God looks at you, you, as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. If that doesn't build you up, well, I, I guess I don't understand. How can God look at me as being holy, unblameable, unreprovable? Well, He must not know what a rotten person I, I am. I mean, but, well, He does. He chose me from before the foundation of the world. He redeemed me, not because I asked Him to, not because I wanted Him to. He loves me. And that ought, to build, that ought to build me up. And then it, it ought to encourage me. Folks, how much time do you suppose David spent dwelling on the sin in his life? You know, it must have been horrible. But what did God say? God said, Fear not, David, thou shalt shall not die, for God has put away thy sin, and that's just as true for you as it is for me as it was for David. Encouragement. Encouragement to know that God so loves me that He put away my sin, that I stand before Him with no charge. And, and comfort. Comfort. What, what comfort to know that He loves me and that He's returning for me. We have not seen, nor has it entered into our hearts the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. You know, and that's, that's an interesting verse because it's, it's both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. No matter how you dream, it has never entered into the mind of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. You know, I'm, I'm persuaded that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What, what comfort that is. Do you know that comfort? For we look for the appearing of our great God, even our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. According to the working whereby He's able even to subdue all things unto Himself. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which have been put to sleep, made to go to sleep, 
in Jesus. And it goes on and on. And how does it end? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's what we ought to get. That's, that's what we ought to get from this book. You know, to, to go away from church feeling hungrier than ever or feeling burdened or guilt, dearly beloved, if you come to this book as a member of the body of Christ, God is not torturing you. God is not trying to make you worry or be concerned. He wants you not to worry. We all go through this struggle. Consider the lily of the field, how they toil not, neither do they spin. Lily didn't even choose where it was planted. And Christian after Christian complains about where he was planted. Lily never did that. Christian after Christian complains about his supply. That Lily never did that. Just took whatever God gave it. And how much more value are you than the Lily of the field, which today and tomorrow vanishes away? Folks, what I'm suggesting here, what I'm saying, is that the contrast between verse 2 and verse 3 is the contrast between immaturity and maturity. It's the contrast between childishness and maturity, of being a child and being a grown-up. I believe that context is clearly diminishing emphasis on speaking in languages that one has never known before. And take note, that because that just look at it. That thought will continue on through this 14th chapter. Verse 4 then seems to change again. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. If God's word is properly proclaimed, the church is built up. Well, that's interesting because how do we determine whether the church is built up? Well, well, here's how we determine that. We determine that by uh, how tall a steeple that you got or how big a herd you have, you know. You know, the general idea is that if your church isn't a growing church, then you're doing something wrong. And I've heard that for years. You know, as though the the criteria for God's blessing, God's direction, is growth in money, growth in numbers, whereas it ought to be growth in, in understanding, growth in encouragement, and growth in comfort. That's what it ought to be. I think there's a, a great starving of the church going on in the world today, folks. There's so much flesh in what's taught and so, so little that is truly of the Spirit. God's emphasis is to build you up, not tear you down. To encourage you, not discourage you, and to comfort you. Not coddle you, but comfort you. Not give you everything that you want. Not make you uneasy. Not convict you. He's, he's clearly declaring to you the riches of His grace and the blessings that He's freely bestowed upon you, but so if one speaks in a language he doesn't understand, he may be building himself up, but he's not doing anything for the church. Keep this in historical context, folks. Of course, there's a modern day, present day application, but keep it in context. Again, I, sug I suggest that the contrast in verse 4 is between that which is childish and that which is mature. The church went through a stage of infancy. So do we as believers. 
The childish one speaks in an unknown language to himself, but the mature one proclaims God's truth to the church, and thereby the church is built up. Verse 5, I wish that you all spoke with languages. The word unknown, folks, is not there. There is no unknown in verse 4. There's no unknown in verse 5. You Greek students will confirm that. Okay. <clears throat> now I would that you all spoke with languages, not some babbling which is foolishness, but actually a language, a spoken language. The text is folks is saying, I wish that you all spoke in languages, but much rather that you proclaim, not as much foretell something that's going to happen, but that in general you proclaim the word of God, which would obviously, in, by, na by, reason, by natural reasoning, it would follow that it would include those things which are to come, those things in the future. Once again, same contrast, that which is childish and that which is mature. It's interesting how it, in John, he refers to us as children, young men, old men. There's nothing wrong with that which is childish, folks, okay? I wish you all spoke in languages, but much rather that you proclaim. For greater is he that proclaims than he that speaks in languages. This is what the text is saying. Once again, we have the contrast. Much greater, really, is he that proclaims than he that speaks in languages, except unless, of course, well, unless, unless the one that speaks in languages interprets in order that the church may be built up. Well, does that mean that, that he himself interprets? No, I don't think so. So he understood the language and, and that's possible, clearly possible, for someone who knows another language to come up and speak it, you know, and then tell you what he said. The problem with that, though, the problem with that is the only one that knows what he said in actual fact is one who understood the language. Now, I don't know whether I can illustrate that or not. So, so you, you, speak, you speak in areas where you don't know the language. You have an interpreter, and you say something, you say something, and the interpreter, he says something. Well, is he saying what you said? I, well, I guess you've got to kind of take that on faith. You don't really know for sure that what he's saying is what you said or not. So the problem with a self-interpreter is, well, he's, he's, the, he's the, only, the only one who's interpreting what he said in a language that nobody else understands. And if his interpretation isn't right, well, then the whole problem falls down. 1st on in this chapter, it will be clear that one should not speak in tongues unless an interpreter be present. So, it's more likely that if there is someone else there to interpret what that person said, then, well, we, you know, we might get closer to what he said. I don't know, but it's a real problem. When we're speaking in languages that others don't understand, you know, like for, you know, if you see a news conference of, you know, you see interpreters on TV all the time or, or take the, you know, like the United Nations, okay, uh, you all know that when anybody speaks, there's an interpreter, he's going right along, and, and I assume that person's got to be really good. Uh, I mean, really good, because surely there's other people there that listen, that are listening, that understand the language being spoken, so that 
that kind of raises a that raises a big question. You know, if if the interpreter were wrong, well, how do you do that in the church? And the scripture seems to indicate that one should not speak in a language he didn't know unless unless there was somebody else there who knew that language and was able to interpret. Verse 6, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, well, we see, we continue to see a contrast between that which is childish and that which is mature. If, if, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, with the language, and, and I stress again that this word for tongues, folks, that we are seeing means a spoken language. It means a spoken language that's able to convey meaning. What shall I profit you, says Paul. He's using himself as an example here. Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, that is proclaiming, or by doctrine. That's the only way I'm going to do anything for you. Once again, the same contrast between that which is childish and that which is mature. If I come speaking in a language that you don't understand, there's no profit for you unless I actually speak to you by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or doctrine. Now, the question is, is, is that four things there? Or is that two groups of two? I uh, kind of lean toward the two groups of two myself. I'm really not going to, uh, I can't say for sure, but, but that's a big discussion among many Bible teachers. Revelation reveals knowledge. Proclaiming God's Word is proclaiming doctrine, that awful word doctrine, you know, the one that everybody hates so much. So maybe there are two groups of two. Maybe there are in fact four things, but all of those four things, all of those four things are indispensably, folks, connected with this book, connected with God's Word. Revelation comes from God's Word. Knowledge comes from God's Word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the knowledge that God wants us to know is in this book. You know, I can't help but think that, you know, the day will soon come when I stand in glory and God's going to He's going to point out things that I should have seen in the Word that I never did. You know, it was always there. Everything He wants me to know was always there. Revelation is the Word of God. Knowledge is the Word of God. Proclaiming doctrine is the truth of God's Word. That's the mature. The immature was the speaking in an unknown language. Let me ask you, folks. Let's be honest here. Now, where, where is, is, he, is the e interest, even today, in the unknown language? Yeah, I know, you know, a lot of excitement when somebody stands up and rattles off in an unknown language. I always wanted to be able to speak at least several languages fluently. But, you know, as, as some have kindly pointed out, I don't even do English very good or very well. How is it, how is it, what is it, very good or very well? I have no idea. This is the truth, folks, of God's Word. What a contrast from speaking in a language I didn't know Verse 7, we continue the same contrast. 
even things without life-giving sound. Pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? You know, if, you know, if if I played a harp here, folks, it'd be a mess. I mean, I'd, or you know, guitar. I, I would hope Larry wouldn't be here to hear me play the guitar without without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp. Except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? Isn't that interesting? So again, we have again we have the childish and the mature. Now look at the next verse. Verse 8, For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? You know, it, it could really be serious if an instrument isn't played right, if it isn't done right. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? You know, wouldn't it be awful if you were supposed to charge, you know, and then the guy on the horn, you know, he blew a retreat, you know, or, or vice versa? The uncertain sound could have serious consequences. If we spend our time in the childish, we may pay a price in maturity. You know, we're going to wind up childish for most of our lives. It's time we grew up. Unbelievable how little Christians seem to know after years and years of being a Christian. You know, I'm sure that that's, part of that's from our enemy, the devil. It's, it's also partly the work of the flesh, which is our enemy. But if you want a trumpet, folks, if you want a trumpet that gives you the correct sound... It's that Bible that you hold in your hand. What is said here on this channel may or may not be truth. But what God has revealed in this book is truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, says our Lord. So we'll close on verse 9. So likewise you, unless you utter... By the tongues, words easy to understand. How will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. Into the air. It's a waste of time. May it be that on this channel, God's word is faithfully proclaimed. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word that comforts us, encourages us, guides us, directs us. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works in serving you. We thank you for all that love, all of that guidance, that, that encouragement that you give us. I ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.